I have the great pleasure of introducing the first speaker today, uh, Professor Vincent Muller. He is at the American College in Thessaloniki in Greece, and at the same time, he is also a professor at the well-known university, Oxford University in the United Kingdom. Uh, Professor Muller is also coordinating a large European network, the so-called EU COG network on cognitive systems, which unites interested uh, individuals and uh, research groups all over Europe, but also worldwide. And he is interested, among other things, in the philosophy and theory of artificial intelligence. Uh, now, just before I go, I give the floor to uh, Vincent, just a comment. So please, to the virtual uh, audience, the global virtual audience, please listen carefully to Professor Miller's lecture. And perhaps you can start thinking about, as you listen, think about potential questions that you might want to ask at the end, because at the end we're going to have a Q&A session and so that you are ready with your questions by then. Okay, now Professor Muller will talk about computers can do almost nothing. Well, it's definitely a provocative title, except cognition, perhaps. Okay, so it's uh, for all the your talk. Okay, thank you, Rolf, for uh, that introduction. Um, I'm, I'm talking from my office, so I'm not sure the uh, connection is particularly good, but I think it's okay in terms of sound. Um, the talk, as you can see, the guy in the back, this is the guy who's basically giving the talk, Plato. Um, so I'm in a philosophy department, so the style of the whole thing is a bit different from the stuff that you're used to, I suppose. Um, can you see my slides? the uh, yes. blue thing there? Yes, yeah. you can see okay, your slides. Great. Okay, excellent. So I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so the idea is that we, I talk a little bit about a fairly basic notion, that, that is the notion of computation, which is important in uh, cognitive science and in AI. Obviously, in the kind of AI that and robotics that Rolf is talking about quite a lot, it has a lot less importance uh, than in traditional approaches. Uh, and the question is exactly what is computation and what kind of role should it play uh, in our efforts. So here's a, here's a quick overview. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the classical picture, uh, which is something Rolf already mentioned in the previous lectures. And then I'll look at one alternative picture that we haven't talked about in these lectures at all, I think, namely the computational brain as opposed to the behavior. I'll try to analyze that a little bit, what does computational mean? Um, what is digital computation? What are the causal powers? That is, what can a computer, qua computer, do? Uh, I talk about the notion of realization, different realizations, and then I come to a conclusion. Uh, that's conclusion one, but I've been thinking about this, and so uh, I think probably I should change my conclusion and I, or add another one, so I have conclusion two. Uh, and if we have time, then we'll talk about the uh, objections also. Okay, so here's the classical um, picture. Um, the, the classical view, which is basically the fundamental view for cognitive science and artificial intelligence at, at their founding uh, periods, so in the 40s and 50s, um, is that is what's now called the computation representational theory of the mind or computationalism. That is the, that the human mind is a functional computational mechanism that operates on representations. Um, the functional bit is something that Rolf talked about earlier. So it's important because it indicates that what you have to look at in the case of, a, of something that has mental state, so it believes something or it plans something and so on, is the function that certain components of that play in the particular system and not how they're made. So this gets you away from the idea that if you wanted to make an artificial intelligence system, you will actually have to make neurons necessarily. Um, and, and then, of course, there is the idea that this works over representations of the world, so often these are language-like, uh, and uh, 
this produces the problem how these representations are actually generated, and that's the next bit there, uh, the various theories and how that works um, biologically uh, or th through information to theoretical processes. Uh, there's a whole theoretical discussion about that. The, as I already said, the motivation for this view is functionalism, in specifically uh, what's, what's known as machine functionalism. Here's one of the first proponents of that view, uh, and now critic, characterizing it. So there's a quote from uh, Paul Churchill, says, what unites them, namely the cognitive creatures, is that they're all computing the same or some part of the same abstract sensory input prior state to motor output subsequent state function. Notice how different that is from what Rolf just talked about in these, in these robots, right? Uh, they don't seem to be computing a function of that sort, but that was the classical uh, approach in, in cognitive science and artificial intelligence. So, um, and add to this approach, now I don't need to say this because most of you are computer scientists, um, a rough idea of what, what a computer does and what it can do. I think a nice characterization of that is the uh, church Turing thesis, namely that basically everything that's effectively computable can be computed by a Turing machine that is a step-by-step -step computation uh, following an algorithm. Now, this picture has come under criticism from various directions, um, some of which have been mentioned in the lecture already. Um, so I'll just mention a couple which explain why people are now working on different fields. Uh, some people say this is more a philosophical criticism that meaning and other intentional states such as uh, believing and uh, planning and so on uh, can't be produced through computation. So the Chinese room argument is, is a classic of that and Pickard's criticism of encodingism. Yes? Can I ask just a quick question? Could you very briefly elaborate what intentional states are? Okay, yes. Uh, an intentional state, uh, that's a word philosophers or other people use for states of a cognitive system that are directed at something. So, for example, if I believe that the sun is shining outside, I am believing something about the state of things outside my room. Um, if I say thank you, uh, I mean to thank someone I'm talking to. So it's a state that is directed at objects, states, and so on, uh, outside the cognitive system itself. Okay. okay. Um, so it's the kind of thing that we use every day. We say I mean this, I believe that, uh, and so on. Um, okay. So. Further criticisms uh, have come from a rather different direction, namely that's what, what's called embodiment, and some people uh, expand that to enactment in cognitive science. So they basically discover that cognitive systems uh, have a lot of their interesting properties due to the particular bodies uh, with, in which they operate or with which they operate. Um, and that's, I think, now a fairly commonplace uh, position in cognitive science, that bodies are an important part of the explanation for the cognitive abilities of agents. Um, a sort of a version of that is what uh, Rolf is talking about quite a lot, namely that the morphology is crucial for the intelligent action. So we heard that today when the sensor is placed in a different way or the springs have a different tension, then uh, these robots wouldn't be hopping in the right way. Um, then there is a uh, criticism from people who say that representationalism has been a bad idea, that maybe we should do entirely without representations, or we should do without representations in the traditional digital sense. So, for example, there are some linguists now who say that things like word, phoneme, and so on are actually just constructs, and uh, they don't play any causal role in, in the way we learn languages and, and perform. Um, and finally, there's a well, in my list anyway, there's a, a large direction of people who think that um, in order to understand what cognition is, you actually have to understand that cognitive agents are goal-directed, so they, are, they don't just have states which you can describe that things are like that, but you can, they have states which you should describe as the 
this system wants to do this, tries to avoid that, thinks this is good, this is bad, this is desirable, and so on. So you could not just describe the world, you actually have to say, do something which is called prescription. Right? You can say, this is desirable, good state, bad state, and so on. Um, and some people take that further uh, and say, these are abilities that only living systems have for some reason. Uh, it's not something I'm going to go into in detail now. So this is just a very sort of rough uh, sketch of a couple of uh, directions that things have taken. So, and, and I think the lecture that you're seeing here is an example of that. If you would have taken a, an introduction to AI 20 years ago, it would have looked very, very different. Um, and so we, we now think that we might look at, at things differently. Now, here is a proposal that uh, might do that in a different way from the ones that we've discussed so far, however. Uh, so far we discussed, um, okay, let's say good old-fashioned AI, as, as we said, GoFi, that's uh, Jim Hoagland's term, is pretty much dead. Um, so maybe this functionalism approach is also pretty much dead. But some people have said, okay, why shouldn't we just take the whole thing a little bit further down, so to speak, at more basic level? So why shouldn't we talk about functions and computation, not on, this, on the level of, um, of psychological descriptions, but on the level of neurological descriptions? And if we could do that, then maybe we could reproduce this in different hardware. So we could actually explain how the brain works uh, and then reproduce the brain in different hardware and have another brain that does that job. Um, this is quite a popular discussion at the moment. Um, at the bottom there, I have a couple of references. The first one is the paper by Anders Sandberg, one of my colleagues at Oxford. Um, and the paper is in the... Uh, on the Shanghai Lecture site, so you can download it if you want. Uh, there is, of course, Henry Markram's Human Brain Project. I shouldn't mention that in Rolf's presence, but uh, uh, that's a similar idea. We should um, try to look at what, how the brain works and reproduce it. Ray Kurzweil, the notorious uh, futurist, is having a new book coming out soon um, on that very project. So I want to look at the, this idea is it possible to reproduce the brain uh, on a different computer and what would the result be? Uh, one popular way, popular way of, of putting that, by the way, is to say whether we could be uploaded in some way. So some people actually think we could just take people's brains, upload them on different hardware, and then we could oh no, live forever. Um, slightly more down to earth, here is a classic uh, view from someone uh, who's uh, co-founded this field, but from a, a neuroscience perspective. That's Christoph Koch's uh, book, Biophysics of Computation. Um, and he says characteristically in the beginning of the book that the brain computes. And this is accepted as a truism by the majority of neuroscientists engaged in discovering the principles employed in the design and operation of the nervous system. And the truth is made that you have incoming data, there's some kind of encoding, there is computational operations, and then there's some kind of control of output. Um, notice that he says that's accepted as a truism. So he thinks that this is really not something worth discussing much. What he's discussing in the rest of the book is how it works, and how the different cells do their job, and how the cells clusters do their job, and so on. Um, so what I want to discuss, I'll skip the the next quotation. What I want to discuss is the thing in blue then at the end. Uh, if we would then understand how this works, which is still something that we need to work on, and reproduce it on a different machine, different Turing machine, on a different digital computer, would it produce intelligence? So maybe we shouldn't be struggling with all this AI and cognitive science, but just, you know, take the intelligence system that we have and reproduce it in a computer. Um, I think in order to understand what this would imply, it's important to realize a couple of basic things about computation. Um, if you have a, a computer of some sort, uh, like the laptop in front of me, 
or maybe the thing in my skull, if that is a computer. Uh, there are at least three ways, three basic ways in which you can describe it. You can look at it in physical terms, right? So you can say this thing has neurons or it has uh, semiconductors and how that works. You can look at it in syntactic terms. So you can say these are the algorithms it, it carries out. Uh, you can describe those mathematically, formally, okay? And you can look at it in semantic terms. In other words, you can see what the meanings of these components are and say, oh, okay, now he's computing the distance between his hand and the glass so that he can grab it. Okay, so physical, syntactic, and semantic. If you have that distinction, then you can understand the grounding problem which Rolf mentioned in one of the earlier lectures. Um, here is the um, classic quote by uh, Jim, uh, by Harnad. Um, he says, how can the meanings of meaningless symbol tokens manipulated solely on the basis of their arbitrary shapes be grounded in anything other, anything but other meaningless symbols? So, in other words, how, if the computer is operating syntactically, right, on bits and bytes, uh, which are meaningless symbol tokens manipulated solely on the basis of their arbitrary shapes, right, the computer is manipulating those because there are bits in which have a certain state, on or off, not because they have a meaning of some sort. How can that ever get you to a level where you have a device that can actually, for example, mean what it says, like I can? Um, so I, I think it's, in, in order to understand this notion of computing, uh, a very useful um, component is to, is to use the word, the notion of multiple realization. So as I have there under 4.1, the same computation can be realized in several ways in different hardware. This is a truism for a computer scientist, but it's important to, to realize that. So if you take one, one computation, a certain little piece of algorithm or something like that, you can realize that several times and you can realize it on totally different hardware. Um, and it's literally the same computation, it's not just sort of similar or something like that, right? Um, and so I think this is definitional for computation, that it is multiply realizable. So you can realize the exact same uh, type, uh, tokens of the exact same type on different systems at different times, and different hardwares and so on, okay? So keep that in mind. I think that's a crucial piece. If something is therefore not multiply realizable, then it isn't computation, it's whatever, something else. Um, okay, so having understood computation a little better now, given the multiple realizability, we can ask ourselves whether reproducing the computation from one device, for example, the brain, to another device, let's say uh, some conventional computing device, uh, would reproduce the behavior. And I think it's pretty obvious now that that would not be the case. Um, a simple example is if you would produce the model of an apple tree, uh, that it wouldn't produce any apples if you had the model run on your laptop. It would presumably produce apples in the model, sort of apple star, right? But, but nothing edible would come out, okay? Um, even though it produces the same computation, or to put it in a more simple way, it's the second point. If you have one implementation that at the end of it, let's say, comes up with a red light that's on, you can put the exact same computation into a different device, and at the end of it, you'll have some switch that is, let's say, turned off, right? So a lever that, that moves from one side to the other. So the the position of the lever, or whether the light is on or off, isn't caused by the computation, but is caused by the realization in the particular device. Okay, so the fact that the green light next to my camera there on the laptop is now on, isn't caused by the computation alone, but it's caused by the computation plus the specific hardware uh, features on which this is running. Good. 
And these are not computational features. Okay, so hardware dependent features aren't computational because they can't be multiply realized in the same way. So I wouldn't call morphological computation computation. That's a terminological difference between me and Rolf. Okay, so I, I think you can see where that's going if you, for the original um, question. Um, so you would have to figure out whether the uh, brain is a digital computer uh, if you wanted to say that it's, uh, the reproduction will produce intelligence. Uh, you'll have to say that it's hardware independent, so any embodiment thesis must be totally false, which is very unlikely to be true. Um, and it must be meaning independent. So also there is a, that's the note bit there. Um, you must say that the brain is totally independent from the body, which is kind of difficult to say since the brain, of course, isn't a neatly separated device, but there is a central nervous system and then the entire nervous system, which is in, in all your body. Uh, and which is intimately intermingled uh, with all that body. So um, this means, uh, to summarize, the brain can only be reproduced on a different Turing machine if A, the brain is, a, is actually a digital computer, if you understand functionally correctly how it works, and for the causal powers that it has, only the syntactic level matters not the hardware and no semantic features of it. As I say there in the parentheses, I think that looks hopeless. It might not be hopeless, but it looks hopeless to me. Okay. Um, so that leads us to, to conclusion number one. That seems to be the easy conclusion. So if we have the initial question, if the whole brain is a computer and we, we could scan it and reproduce on, on different Turing machine, would it have, would it produce intelligence? Uh, the answer is no. So, or to put it in the terms that Rolf introduced in lecture one, uh, computation alone can't be the cause of, of intelligent behavior, all this coping, achieving aims, learning, cooperation, producing culture, and so on. Um, I think, by the way, that culture is more important uh, than phylogenetic uh, development, but anyway, that's a different detail. Um, if you want, you can, you can phrase what I, what I just said in the form of a dilemma. So you can say, either the system is multiply realizable or it isn't. If it is multiply realizable, so for example, it's computation, then only syntactic properties are maintained from one realization to another. And that's not enough. Right? If it is not multiply realizable, so like hardware features, for example, then we need a separate argument for the view that the two realizations share some kind of property, for example, that they're both intelligence or they both mean something or so on. Okay, so this is the negative part. Now, uh, it looks like I, I'm trying to say that computing has almost no power. So this is the first part of the title, if you want. So what about maybe cognition? Um, well, maybe one shouldn't be throwing out the uh, babe with the bathwater. Um, maybe purely syntactic structures is exactly what's needed for cognition or for what you call information processing. I'm not a great fan of, of that word because I think that information is even less clear than computation. Um, but look at what people do. So, you know, in the next lecture, we'll hear somebody talking about machine translation there for remote games, data mining, search, manufacturing stuff, all the GoFi stuff, if you want to put it this way, actually works quite nicely. And, and they seem to be doing fine with just syntactic structures. Uh, and so are other people. So people who talk about the neural dynamics in the brain, like our colleague Gregor Schoener does, or people who talk about probabilistic approaches, which many people have been doing for a while, and Andy Clark has apparently come around uh, to that kind of view. Um, that seems to work just fine. Now, be careful though. Don't fall into the trap that you're using symbols that mean something to you, but not to the machine. So if the machine tells you something uh, like, you know, game over, that doesn't mean anything to the machine. It means something to you, but to the machine it's just a syntactic structure. Uh, in the video that uh, Scaramuza showed in the previous uh, class, and Sebastian Thrun's video doing 
this uh, robot doing slam when he was trying to sort of orientate himself in this maze. Um, we're tempted to say it's building a map, but it's not really building a map. It's building some kind of structure that allows us to build a map or to interpret it as a map. Right? So be really careful when you attribute these properties to a computer. Uh, it might not actually be what you think the properties are. There are only properties for me, but not properties for the device itself. Um, however, these, um, these syntactic structures and processes are truly multiply realizable, so maybe they are the key uh, to doing the interesting things that we want to do. The causal powers they have, however, and Rolf has illustrated this in his work uh, very uh, impressively in many occasions, depend on the specific realizations. Right? And very often you can do a lot without all these syntactic structures, um, uh, even though you are, um, uh, you could do a lot of that without the syntactic structures, but you can do a lot more interesting things with the syntactic structures. So maybe computation is actually useful for on some level that we might then call cognition, right? But this is somehow separate from intelligence then. Now, I have, a, I have a couple of objections here. Uh, maybe you can tell me, should I go and have a look at these, or should we just uh, stop and have some conversations now? Uh, Rolf, what do you uh, think? I think if you can just briefly summarize, maybe not going into too much detail, uh, then I think it would be nice to see, you know, to get a better flavor of the debate. I think it would be good to see these objections, to understand these objections. So okay, okay, ahead. so I'll do that quickly then. All right. Um, so, um, one objection is, well, that's all very nice, but really what we care about in the, in the brain is obviously not the causal powers that it has in general. You can use a brain as a paperweight, or as, as Alan Turing said, it has the consistency of cold porridge, very British uh, example. Um, but what it really matters is that it's information processing. And so it's trivially a computer, and therefore trivially you can reproduce it on a different computer. Uh, I think that's wrong, uh, because not all information processing is computational, or at least you assume that and you have to argue for it. So that's, I think, a one important question here. What is information processing really doing? Um, well, a more philosophical objection number two is to say, well, you're, you're defined pretty much computational as, as syntactic, and then you say, uh, but there isn't any, any uh, semantics in it. Well, and I say, yeah, fine. If you want to define computation differently, lots of people have been doing this in classical cognitive science. You can do that, but then you have to explain how the semantics get into the game and how they actually explain the behavior of the device. And uh, that's what I say, you're back at square one. That's what we've been trying to do that for the last 30 years. Um, and another point C, which I think is actually quite interesting, is to see, well, you've been talking about computation as if there was only a specific thing, namely this digital Turing-type computation. Uh, maybe that's too narrow-minded. Uh, maybe there is dy dynamic computation, analog computation, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think that's all true, um, but I haven't yet seen anybody uh, produce a reasonable definition of computation which implies all of those except when they use information processing which is as I say even worse um, so if you want to use that kind of thing you want to tell me why these things are called computation and whether they have the property that you want namely are they multiply realizable and do they uh, generate the stuff that you want for example intelligence and so on and the, the last point there are some people who work on brain computer interfaces uh, and there are some people who work on neural replacement systems, so they'd actually replace a small component of the brain uh, in its functional process. So, for example, I mean, some people replace the visual nerve, or I've seen somebody who, who replaces a very small part of memory uh, with a computer. So the fact that you can do that, doesn't that show that the brain is a computer and that you can actually just go on doing that, you know, bigger and bigger pieces and you'll just replace everything? Um, I think it doesn't show that, uh, 
what it shows is that you can replace the function of a, of a system, one system by another system. So, for example, we now have uh, digital telephones. We used to have analog telephones. Um, and we can interact with a digital device uh, in an analog way, for example, if I touch my computer there with my fingers. Um, that doesn't mean that the device itself is digital uh, and can be reproduced uh, digitally, I think. Um, oh, yeah, and the remark on readings I wanted to make. So the, the, I have two things which I suggest that you read. The one is this paper by Anders Sandberg, and the other is the classic paper by John Searle on the Chinese room argument. You, you, you may have read that. I find the, the discussion about the Chinese room argument with many people is kind of frustrating because they haven't actually read the paper. They have actually just heard what people say that Searle says. And so I think one thing that one should do if you want to talk seriously about this stuff is to actually read the whole paper from the beginning to the end. Uh, and you will see, for example, that Searle says that, yes, uh, cognition is computation. And people ignore that kind of stuff. Okay, that's that. So okay. I hand over to Rolf. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Vincent, for a provocative and a highly uh, informative lecture. Of course, there are many things that uh, we can discuss, you know, many questions that come to mind. But I would like to, before I give, you know, my own opinion that you already know uh, on what you, were, what you were explaining, I would like to open the discussion to the uh, global virtual lecture hall. So, would anyone like to ask a question to Professor Muller? I think this is a unique opportunity. You know, he's one of the real experts on, uh, I think, uh, you know, cognitive systems, philosophy of cognitive systems, computation. It, it's quite possible that that I've been a bit overwhelming in some ways, right? So there's lots of there's lots of material in the stuff that I've been talking about, and some of it is right. non-standard. Um, right. So depending on the background that people have, it might be looking very strange. So I, I actually my intention in, in the in the in the way I developed this lecture was basically to have something there which might stick in people's minds and. Uh, they might sort of get back to that kind of worry uh, at some later stage, sort of in the in the spirit of the Plato guy. Um, sorry, maybe uh, one second. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really nice, but uh, it was a lot of information, and it's hard to pick one topic uh, to discuss. But maybe uh, I wanted to talk about uh, um, the tree and the apples. Because that was the first point okay. that uh, confused me. <laughs> um, so the point is, when you have a tree, um, it's based in some environment. And it's really hard to say we get the tree and we simulate the tree and it doesn't produce an apple because we didn't uh, simulate the whole environment. So it's, it's, it's really, for, for me, if we simulate the tree, we have to simulate everything around it. And I think if we okay. would do that, we would get an apple. Um, doesn't that sound like a miracle? I mean, you, yeah, sure. If you wanted to simulate the tree and its function, you would have to simulate the sun and the soil and the water and so on, right? Up to, presumably up to a certain point. You don't have to simulate the entire universe in order to do that. Um, but if you were to simulate that, uh, then your simulated apple tree would presumably grow, it would have seasons, and there would be simulated bees going around to fertilize it and so on. Um, you would still just have the whole thing on your laptop. There wouldn't be any apples coming out. Yeah, but on my laptop there would be virtual apples, and the same like when I have the brain and I um, simulate the brain on my computer and I simulate the environment, um, the brain or the human I would simulate would behave as a normal human in, in, in our environment um, because it's, it's the same thing but just virtual. 
So I could um, run a computer okay. which simulates a human walking around and doing human-like stuff and behave intelligent for my... Good. So what, what this means is that you're saying, um, say, in, in some cases, it matters that things are only simulated. So if I'm hungry, I cannot eat a simulated apple. Okay? The, sim the simulated apple lacks some causal powers, as I call that, yeah. uh, that a real apple has. It has these, of course, in the simulation. I understand that. In the simulation, I can eat the simulated, the simulated Vincent can eat the simulated apple, and it would be nutritious to me. Yes, I understand that. Now, what, what I'm trying to figure out is whether the apple tree on the one hand and the simulated apple tree on the other hand have the same causal properties. Okay? They don't, right? Because the one produces real apples and the other one produces simulated apples. Now, it might be that there are things in the world where the difference between being just simulated and, the, and being real, as you might call that, is not relevant. So exactly one of the questions is, is maybe cognition of that sort? So uh, I think everything that Rolf has been talking about, for example, points into the direction that intelligence is not of that sort, right? So that you can simulate his, his, his uh, nice dog there uh, in a computer. If you do it sufficiently well, it will hop around in the simulation. But you wouldn't get any hopping dog. But if you would simulate a controller of sorts, then you would actually have a controller. Or if you would simulate, I don't know, a chess playing, a chess player, then you might say that is not just a simulated chess player; it's a chess player. So maybe there are some properties which are of that sort that if you simulate them in a computer, you actually get the property itself. Uh, but I think that does not apply to uh, apple making. Yeah, okay. you just get you. Apple Star. I think maybe we can. Uh, I think that was an excellent question. Uh, excellent. Uh, exchange I of ideas. Yeah. I would like to, yeah, for the question also from Zurich, uh, I would like to open the global lecture hall for another question before we close the session. So are there any other comments or questions? I mean, I think I really like the question just asked. Do we have other statements or comments or questions? Uh, may I ask a little question? Sure. Yes, okay. please. Okay. Uh, uh, what is uh, semantics uh, uh, from uh, your point of view? Uh, what is this? Uh, is this uh, connection between uh, something or something else? Now, that is a gigantic question. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But, <laughs> but uh, very oh, roughly okay. speaking, yeah. <laughs> yes, I should have the answers to all the gigantic questions. Um, very roughly speaking, se semantics is the connection between some kind of symbol within a symbol system and something that it is about in the, in the world. Right? So if I, uh, in the classic examples, if you write a Russian word in Kyrillic for me, uh, I can maybe identify the symbols, maybe I can even reproduce them, but but I would not have the semantics. I would not know that this means, I don't know, table, right? So if it has semantics, the word has semantics, then it actually refers to something in the world, so it refers to the stuff which is in front of you, for example. So uh, okay. tell... does that work roughly? So semantic comes from the Greek word simasia, which means meaning. So, Vincent, if I tell a robot uh, to bring me a glass of beer, and he actually brings me the glass of beer, then even though I don't know whether there are symbols in this or not, but they're just sound patterns and then a behavior, uh, could I say a robot has semantics even though there might not be symbols? Um, no, I don't think that would be a good idea. It, it might be one of your very smart 
uh, smartly constructed robots which just uh, re responds to the sound waves in a particular environment in this particular way so it happens to, to bring you a beer, uh, while it, for example, might not have any linguistic parsing abilities. Right? So imagine that you have a robot which actually gets you a beer when you say beer, uh, but you could also say mir and uh, deer and uh, <laughs> veer and whatever. It would just always just take whatever this sound, which sounds something like that, and then it sets off some kind of pattern which runs off to the fridge and gets you a beer. So I think it's pretty clear that if you want to attribute semantics to a system, you would first of all have to attribute to it that there are symbols playing some kind of role somewhere, in, so you actually have to look at how the system works, uh, and then you have to, that's, that's the big question which I said, then you have to say which are the systems where those symbols actually occur, uh, where those symbols actually play a causal role such that you can call that semantics. Uh, that's going to be the big question for the next speaker, I think, uh, because uh, one of the interesting questions is exactly if you want to do machine translation, do you have to understand what the person you're translating uh, from actually says? Which is, that's the way we do it, right? Humans do it like that. They, we understand the words and there, there is good reason to believe that I have an internal system where the words are represented in some way that I can understand. That table means the same as tish and so I can translate it from the one to the other. Uh, that's not, that might not be the case if you have a smart Breitenberg vehicle and uh, whether it will be the case in a smart machine translation system, I think the next speaker is going to tell us about that. Okay, I think Vincent, uh, this is an excellent transition to our next speaker. I would like to thank you again for a thought-provoking lecture and you could see from the discussion that we'll actually get into the, let's say, uh, groove of uh, uh, philosophy, let's say. So thank you again very much, Vincent. And thanks to the audience, the global audience, for the discussion and the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. It was my pleasure.